All right, we're moving closer to the end of this conversation uh, this morning. Now, if you listen to the CBK governor, Dr. Patrick Njoboge, when he was asked as to why we didn't see any reaction really from him in terms of extending moratoriums again upon the second, what we're calling, quote, closure of the economy, he said they're sitting, waiting to see if the economy is going to feel the impact of that, and then they will talk to the banks for a mutually beneficial moratorium environment or organization. Abraham, I didn't understand that. You see, the, the situation is that we are, we are in, in, a, in the same or worse situation than we were last year, yes. time like now. Yes. So the, the, what they did that time, they, 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 they issued a moratorium. Yes. They can do the same. They can do another one year and it will probably have the same effects. Yes. But it will not solve the underlying problems. And the difference between that time and now will be that the issues that are underlying are getting worse yes. for the ones that are bad. Yes. And the ones that are good are getting better. So probably it may be better this time around to deal with the issue, in my, my honest opinion. And to deal with the issue is to, is to, is to now stress, do stress tests for bank on bank on bank on bank. Yes. That bank A has this kind of, uh, X, X was restructured, X is bad, this is the size of the capital, Worst case scenario, best case scenario. Yes. Which is is it also good to look at the general capital adequacy of the banks right now? Yeah, that's which what I'm the, the CBK says is at 54%, the biggest one since 2017. That's what I'm telling you. Yes. But now, sometimes general uh, ratio, I mean, uh, averages mean nothing in, in stations like this. Yes. So I'm saying now it has to boil down to bank by bank. Look at those three metrics the, the restructured debt, yes. the bad debt, and the, and the level of capital. Yes. And then stress it in terms of who, if, if, if the, the restructured and the bad debt of that bank went bad. Will that bank survive? Yes or no? And then, and then now we, we do for all banks yes. and see. So for the ones that will not survive under worst case scenario, we do something about it now. Yes. By telling them either capitalize, merge, be acquired, whatever you need to do. Do, do your cash calls or conserve your cash. Yes. But those, I am I, not private. Maybe those stress, stress tests are going on. I don't know. But I think the time to deal with the issue is now. Because if, if we issue moratoriums, and maybe that's why he's holding back, we'll simply have delayed pain. And maybe we are delaying more pain than we could take the pain if we took it now. Yes. Because what is for sure, going by the results that we are just seeing, it's it's just a pre a precursor of the kind of, of the depth of the issue that is at hand. Yes. So for me and central bank be the regulator and with the kind of powers they have, they can actually delve in and deal with the bank bank by bank by bank. Yes. And still maintain confidentiality that you and I don't have to know the depth and breadth of what is going on in a certain bank yes. and deal with that, that issue and, and, and have a and have a plan. Because short of that, then if, if, if we wait for something to happen, a big shock might have devastating effects. Pretty much. All right, Paul, let's move on to the next issue this morning. Under that area, just a quick one on exactly what you think about the CBK's announcement on them waiting to see whether they can extend moratoriums again to the economy. But then, Paul, uh, the only regulation that we also saw once we got into the COVID-19 pandemic back in March was the CRR, which was revised back to 4.25%. Can you talk to me? What have you seen that impact of that revised CRR in the results that we're giving you this morning? And also, do you support the extension of moratoriums in the economy? Because banks like Equity have looked at themselves in doors and have said, well, our loan book deserves another three years. Yeah, uh, I think the, the, the central bank governor, like many of us, may not know the extent of what the, the, the COVID pandemic, to where it will go. Yes. But it seems, quite, it, it seems, it seems quite positive, Paul. We may have a fifth wave. Yes. Sorry? It seems quite positive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. okay. The, the thing is that uh, at the end of the day, <laughs> And then to stress test all, all these scenarios. And, and this is possible. The kind of, so, and, and this is possibly about a, a month or so since it started. So if, if you're going to go that slowly, it means that uh, unless something else happens, COVID will be here with us for, for quite some time. So rather than do a one-off, uh, you see like the last time when we had the first wave, 
there was a moratorium given, uh, revised CRR, and, and things like that. But maybe now it's time for a, a more generalized or a bigger rule to be made uh, rather than the one-offs that, that were made. So I would think maybe the, the, the governor wants to have a look at that and, and before he makes a decision on what he will do and uh, uh, what they, of course, with the agreement of the, the banks, what, what is the best way forward? Pretty much. All right, John, let me bring you in on that. But as, we, as we saw, the moratoriums really helped. Yeah, yes, Paul, uh, clear, clear your point. Okay. Yeah, yeah so uh, I, I think that's what he's waiting to see, basically, yeah. All right, Joanne, let me bring you in as well in that conversation. Where do you stand in terms of the moratoriums now as the banking industry also contends with the second closure of the economy? Should we just extend the moratoriums again or we wait and see? That's the same, same perspective that the CPK governor is taking. Uh, for me, I think we, I I. I, I... that we should actually I'm very keen to see um, to uh, are they going to you know are they going to help in terms of what are they going to do differently for the, the common uh, businesses so um, I, I, I would look at a, a wait and see situation yes uh, in terms of uh, should we extend to what extent should we extend um, Things like that, so that we, we can understand uh, how how things are going to go. For me, it's, it's an issue of uh, bringing in government in terms of helping of, or, or minimizing the, the, the effects of, of the third wave of COVID, and in terms of what the vaccinations will do for us, uh, whether they will um, uh, be a positive effect to, to the economy in terms of people getting back to work and... Uh, the lockdown being uh, 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 you know, cap coming to one and so I, I, I I'm into all right, um, but we seem to be having a problem uh, with the connection, uh, uh, Joanne. Let's hopefully we're going to get it uh, um, solved in just a couple seconds. All right, which begs us to go into the next part of our conversation this morning. And Arnold, I'd like to bring you in as we clear this morning on the impact of the regulation within the industry. Now, we do know IFRS 9 should have already been showing its impact in the banking industry's results. Arnold, have we seen it or we have to wait? All right, as we wait for that to get reconnected, Abraham, can we take on RFRS 9? When are we likely to see the. Yes, Arnold, you can. I think, I think we have to wait uh, simply because I think the governor has realized if you continue with the restructures. Yes. Uh, you're likely you're likely to have banks continue to uh, post lower and lower uh, income positions, and at the same time, if you put a blanket uh, position on on the banks, you again you again don't know where you, you again don't know where where things will go as far as the uh, the economy is concerned. As I alluded to earlier, the thinking was that 2021 would be a rebound year. But it looks like it may not happen. So I think the government, the governor is in a situation whereby he's looking probably for a collective solution from all the stakeholders before he can make a call. Because if he makes a call, yes. it may adversely affect an, an already uh, negatively affected uh, uh, industry. So it's, uh, I, I think a wait and see would probably be prudent.
and then probably a collective solution be agreed between the regulator and the players in the industry. Pretty much. All right, Abraham. When are we likely to see uh, IFRS 9 tech full effect, or is it being sort of put on hold for now? No, IFRS 9, in my, in my most ambition, is in, is in force. Yes. The challenge with IFRS 9, IFRS 9 gives broad guidelines of how to do pro forma uh, provisioning and, and, uh, and after, af after the event pro provisioning. Yes. But it does not give the, the, the modalities of doing it. So you find all banks have different models of doing it. Yes. So, so, so in terms of comparing the, w how somebody has treated IFRS 9, you cannot compare it across banks. But they, but they have, because the provision is already in force. And this account, and, and, and the account, all these accounts have been prepared yes. under IFRS. So if, if they be prepared under IFRS and the auditors have certified them, then definitely IFRS 9. And, unless, and I've not seen anywhere circular anywhere in the world that IFRS 9 was suspended. Yes. So it is in force. But the full effect is that, you see, the models banks are using, you see, IFRS 9 is such that you use historical data to try and project your performer, your performer provision. Yes. So you can, you, you can do a model that, that gives you a very low provision. Or you can do a model that gives you a very high provision. So I'm telling you, there's a lot of leeway. So maybe over time, central bank will also rein in on what is the minimum you can do, what is the maximum you can do. But as things stand now, the interpretation of, of, of IFRS 9 has been left to the banks, between the banks and the auditors. So, 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 so to that extent, it is in force. But as to whether you can compare the application of IFRS 9 from one bank to another, you may, you, you may not. Yes. Because the, the models that is underlying the, IFR, the application of the IFRS 9 is not the same. Yes. But is it in force? Yes, it is in force. Paul, let's continue with our conversation. Are we likely to see the application of IFRS 9? And if you go by what we've seen this morning in terms of those results, and would you expect that the effects are going to be deeper, even in tier 2 and tier 3 banks? Talk to me about the impact of that regulation and can you relate the, that to whether we're going to see a lot of mergers and acquisitions if 2021 is not really going to be a rebound year? Yeah, okay, in the banking book. So for anybody, for any bank to get a, a clean audit report, they must have done their provisions using IFRS 9. Now, IFRS 9, as Abraham has mentioned, uses historical data to project or to predict what are the future losses. So, if in a sector like uh, real estate, your past data tells you that uh, maybe 5% of the loans in the past were, were going bad, then you use that to predict what would happen in the future. Yes. So the biggest impact of IFRS 9 was in the year that it was implemented. So that's what the biggest impact was. Uh, however, as Abraham says, the models that you have to use to do that prediction are very subjective. Different banks can use different models such that they may use a model that will hit a lower future uh, pro provision. So the auditor's role is just to evaluate the models. So you find that, as at now, the biggest impact of implementation of IFRS 9 has already was already taken in, in the year that IFRS 9 was implemented. However, as, as central bank and the, as auditors get more and more competent in the impl implementation, of IFRS 9, then you find that the provisioning IFRS 9 being between the banks will start from a moratorium model. forces banks to take provisions now when there is a likelihood of default. We find that we are a lot more resilient in uh, making sure that they measure and, uh, and accurately. Uh, IFRS 9, uh, the most impact has already been taken in. However, in, in future, what we'll see is that banks will be getting better and better in predicting what are their losses in the future.
pretty much as well, Joan. Hopefully now we have that recon that connection we established uh, this morning. Joan, take us to the last part of our conversation uh, this morning on the performance of um, the banking industry in a uh, 2020. Let's talk about the big boys, Joan. Um, the cooperative, Equity, and um, KCB. We do know that they have regional interests as well. Some of which have actually put them in that position of even reducing or canceling their dividend payouts. Talk to me about that. Uh, is the local banking industry ready for regional investments? Going by how one boy, Cooperative Bank, took a big hit from the investments in um, Sudan. Um, well, I, I think that um, the banks are ready for regional investment. Um, of course, Kenya being a bigger economy. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, growth and uh, in terms of uh, what do you call it establishment, I, 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 I think it will be a slow one in uh, in terms of uh, the fact that the economies are not in the same uh, um, not in the same space as the Kenyan economy. Yes. Uh, of course, uh, governments are threatened. The, 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 already yes but in terms of um, uh, uptake from the other side it's a, a slow trend um, and of course depending on the political uh, stability and political environment in those countries of course they will be affected by those um, uh, other nations how they operate in terms of the political environment so we are ready yes but in terms of uh, ambition in terms of uh, ability to grow that of course be a slower uh, trend than, than what we expect because of um, um, the different uh, climates and of course the pandemic and how, and how different governments are, are, are reacting and, 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 uh, and, and, and reacting and acting in accordance to what their the capabilities yeah pretty much abraham Corporate bank side, well, one of the reasons is why we have a bigger profitability dip as well, other than the COVID-19 pandemic, is what they called currency conversions in southern Sudan. Swafu begs the question, and we're also, we're also saying um, last year, equity also sort of held back their proper investments that they wanted to actually do across the region, saying, let's wait and see exactly what happens of the COVID-19 pandemic situation, which, again, they actually went forward to do. KCB as well, they're, they're bigger in regional investments as well. Which begs the question, are we ready for the local banks to actually look regionally for investments? No. First of all, if we start, if we compare Kenya, Nigeria, yes. South Africa, you'll find that Kenya is overbanked. If you look at the, the per capita per bank. Yes. So we have more banks serving per, per person in Kenya than in Nigeria or in South Africa, which are the two biggest economies. So it means probably we may have more bank capacity in Kenya than we need. Now, since we are not shrinking that capacity, then that capacity needs to go somewhere else. Yes. Because that capacity is also still growing. Yes. So yes, we are we, we are ready in a bond. We are because of our level of sophistication, our level of human capital, our, level, uh, our, our sophistication in channels. We're ready to go there. But is it, is it time to go there now? No, because right now, most banks or any prudent bank right now should be consolidating. You're trying to just keep what you have and staying alive. So and that's what you mean by uh, equity uh, retreated. There are times they are they done deals to in, in, in southern, southern Africa and, and they retreated on those deals. Yes. And then, but the other day they bought one, but popular in, uh, in in DRC. So, so this is a time to basically consolidate and get ready. Once things even out, yes. then yes, you pounce. As to what happened to Cooperative Bank in Sudan, I think it was not unique to them. KCB went through the same thing. Yes. Uh, Equity went through the same thing. The, the only reason they felt it more is because they are, the only place they're out of out of Kenya is only South Sudan. Yes. So they, they had nowhere else to mitigate. Yes. These other guys had like KCBs in Rwanda, Uganda, they, in all our neighbors. So the, the others were able to cushion what was going on in South Sudan. Yes. South Sudan is unique because it was a good market, then whatever then because of political issues, 
you can't get your currency out. So, so then you have issues of where you're showing money as assets, but you really that, that, that liquid cannot help you. Yes. But that is a problem that can only be probably be solved at a diplomatic level. So I think it's even beyond the banks that yes. are in hand. But to answer your question, Kenyan banks, if there are banks that are going to expand, the same way Nigerian banks expand to us, it's us who will expand to the, to, to the region, to the wider region, and then now we'll have pan -Afri I think in the, in the next five, maximum five years, we'll have a Pan-African bank yes. stemming out of Kenya. Pretty much. Yeah. All right, um, Paul and Arnold, we actually have only two minutes left. Can I get one response from you on exactly how or whether the Kenyan banking industry is ready for regional investments? Let me start with you, Arnold. Are we ready? What we seem to have lost. Arnold, Paul, can you confirm when you can get me, sir? Yes, I can get you. Yes. I, I, what yes, is I think we are ready okay. uh, Arnold, for regional investment. Yes, I will take, uh, take it. Yes, Arnold. KCB and banks have been trailblazers as far as uh, uh, regional investment is concerned. Kenya is a uh, big economy as far as East and Central Africa is concerned. So it simply means our banks have that capacity to grow regionally to Rwanda, to Uganda, Tanzania, and probably even the DRC. So I think the capacity is there, the muscle is there, and uh, the proficiency is there. Pretty much, Paul. 45 seconds if you may, sir. Are we ready for regional investments <laughs> as, an, as a local industry? Yes, but not, not all banks are ready. Yes. Only those who have sufficient uh, infrastructure, those which have put in inf infrastructure that, uh, like a shared service center, uh, that it doesn't matter where you are, a transaction can happen to a place like Congo, very vast, like Ethiopia, extremely vast. So unless a bank has robust infrastructure to carry out transactions, a good shared service system, those banks are ready. But uh, any bank which has not yet set up that, uh, they need to first set that up and need to consolidate within the country before they actually can go outside the country. I think that's my view. Pretty much. And that uh, uh, last thank from uh, Paul Nyanya this morning. Now, for helps us close our conversation this morning again on the performance of the banking industry, but it doesn't stop here. Let's take the conversation online. Hashtag business at Ahmed Metropole TVKE across all your social media platforms. Let me say a very thank you very much to Abraham Mudogo, the I was the CEO of Mewadi Capital and a banking expert as well. Arnold and Kasala was a microfinance banker. Banker John Maniki, financial analyst as well, and Paul Nyanga, who's a banking expert. They have made really this conversation what it has been this morning. Well, that is it from us. Good morning as well.